At Bethesda Game Studios, we love to create experiences that, through art and technology, transport you. We've brought that to many worlds, but never to what's above us. When we look to the sky, we wonder if we're alone, what's out there, what our future holds. In some ways, since every element in each of us is from the stars, we want to return. Starfield is our first new universe in over 25 years. It's a game we've dreamt of playing. And it's only now that we have the hardware, the technology, and the experience to push our creative boundaries even further. In it, we invite you to join Constellation, the last group of space explorers. It's a next generation role-playing game where you'll be who you want, go where you want, experience our stories, and forge your own. More than that, Starfield's about hope, our shared humanity, and searching for the answers to life's greatest mystery. We have a lot to share. For the first time, we'll provide an inside look at the inspiration and process behind Starfield. We hope you'll join Constellation and go with us on the journey as we craft our next epic. I think the one thing people underestimate about video games is that people think it's just playtime. But I always say that the one thing video games can give you that nothing else in entertainment can is that feeling of pride, right? Look what I did. And even though we want to make a game that is very big and is very long, you can play for all of those years, it's all the paths you didn't take that make it special to you, that you feel like when you finish that quest, that you feel that you accomplished something that week. The people who love video games can always say like, you know, what'd you do today? I saved the world. We've been incredibly lucky to work with such a tight group of people for so long. Like we're all friends, it's like a second family in a way. We all sort of know or get what a Bethesda game is. There's definitely this core group who's been working together for decades and knows how to make a BGS game. And then there's this you know, new generation of game developers who are coming in and working at BGS who grew up on those games those people made. For some people, those are the games that got them to go into the industry in the first place. And what I love about that is those people come in and they love the worlds too. And they want to stay true to those worlds that they grew up on. And so we're still able to maintain what a BGS game is, but continue to evolve. I think we underestimate how long people are going to play it. You look at Skyrim, we're sitting here 10 years later and it keeps having this life and it changes how you want to create something. Yeah, I feel like our games sort of have two lives, right? Like we create this game and we put everything we can possibly put into it, tell the stories we want to tell and build this world that's sort of a setup that when we hand it off to the players, they play it, but then they take it and make it their own. They tell their own stories and then they make their own stories with our tools. I think it's the hallmark of our games that, you know, you play it and my experience is going to be different than yours. I'm going to come in and tell you a funny story about something that happened to me. You may never have seen that because it's just a confluence of events. And I think that helps with the longevity and it helps with that feeling of community in a lot of ways. It is a world that you get transported to that you can really make your own. And that's where, you know, for me, the magic is, you know, to do it for two decades and close to that for so much of our group, there's a big trust there that we know how we solve certain things together. We were doing Morrowind and looking at what we might do after that and beyond that. And we, we had a list of what are the other types of worlds we want to go to. And obviously Fallout was at the top of the list. You know, if we could, if we could do that and that, you know, magically, luckily came true for us. And right behind that was, you know, science fiction. Going to Space Thinkers, a magic in just defying gravity and taking off from a planet. Like that's, it's extremely difficult human endeavor. 
Yeah, a lot of our games are about exploration, and that's sort of like, that's the ultimate exploration, is what's, what's out there, what's past Earth, right? So it's incredibly exciting for us to work on something like that. I feel like every time we come to a game, we're starting fresh. We're saying, okay, we just did that one, that's over. How do we make it better in every way? It's got a more realistic, science-based backing to it, whereas Skyrim is sort of a, you know, an epic fantasy. This is a more grounded uh, game and a grounded setting about exploration. So I think that gives us a different take on how we make everything. So that's sort of the thing you latch onto when we're, we're making new areas, making environments, making characters. The mechanics of the world are entirely different, but there are similarities. And I think those, you know, those are things we like. Like we like playing first person. We like having all the coffee cups. We like being able to touch everything. Those moments make, make the whole thing believable. Being able to watch the sunset and nighttime come and just sit there and watch the world go by. Seems like it's not gameplay, but it is vital to how you feel through the rest of it. I also think that because it's based in a more realistic atmosphere is like, you have a lot of people on our team who are super into certain things like robotics or you know engineering and, and they can use this lifetime of knowledge they have gathered and then use it in their work. Everyone comes from you know these different areas and brings stuff to the game that can make it in, and it all it all matters, you know, from the rocks to the the clutter to you know what the spacesuits look like. It's you know based on people's experience and sort of learning about how things work in the world and trying to apply it in a way that's believable for this universe. Yeah, it starts feeling so real to us. Like all you're saying, we do all that stuff, but then concepting like everything they eat or the toys the children play with, or what are their bedtime stories? What is their art? What is their history? What is their entertainment? It is a universe, not just a game. There has to be an emotional trigger that occurs. And I think as time has gone on, we're able to paint an even better picture that triggers that emotional thing. We always have that step out moment into the world, so to say. Technology has changed, we've all changed. So our expectations when loading up a game, like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step out and there's gonna be this moment. Us being able to do that and have it feel new every generation, every game, is something that is really special about what we do. I like to say that Starfield has two step out moments. It's cryptic. Our process of making it is, is a journey for us that is very, very rewarding. And coming to Starfield, everybody's starting over and saying, what would you want to do? What does going to space mean to you? And everybody comes back to the same one. I want to see what's out there. It's a level of immersion that we really focus on. Uh, you're not just playing a game, but you're living in this, in this world, in this universe. It's uh, a giant open world for the player to do what they want. You feel like you've had an impact in the world. You really feel like you're there. There are certain you know, types of entertainment where you're just experiencing it. You're taking in what the creator wants you to see, and they, you know, they draw that dotted line between this happens, go here, do this. The more that we can put you in the situation where you're going to decide. That's what makes video games the best form of entertainment that they are. We don't just make RPGs, like we make simulations, and that leads to a lot of just crazy stuff that can happen and things you don't expect. Yeah, we always have those big fights, like what if a what if combat breaks out right now, right? You have to handle that, right? Because it could, you, you can't control it. The only thing you control is that, that the game has to account for it somehow. We embrace the chaos, let it play out, and usually it's pretty fun. A lot of us have been doing this for a long time together, and it's nice with Starfield to go back to some things we didn't do, the backgrounds, the traits, the defining your character, all of those stats. Um, and I think there's so many games now that do those things that people are ready for something that, that does a lot of the things that, you know, older hardcore RPGs, some that we used to do, doing those again in, in a new way. We've always allowed the player to, you know, to create really interesting, unique characters. 
This game, we've definitely severely leveled up. The tech is based on scanning of real-world models, similar to the photogrammetry we do in our landscapes. We're kind of applying the same thing to our, to our people as well. Because it's not just the appearance of your player and all that, but you know, we want all the personal interactions of NPCs, other characters in the game to be as impactful as possible. And for that, you have to believe these are real people. You're a real person interacting with real people. One of the big choices is which part of the game world am I going to engage in? We always uh, make a bunch of different groups that represent some of the major factions in every game. And in this one, we've got the United Colonies that represents the future Space Republic idealized. You also have the Free Star Collective, which is the Space Western fantasy. People that are out there on the frontier. We've got Reugent Industries, which represents corporate life. I think it has one of the best starts of, of any of the factions yeah, we've it's done. A, it's a, a mega corp, and you have to you get hired, right? Like yeah, you do, right? We'll apply for our job. We'll right. see if you cut, cut the mustard, right? Yeah, I love approaching it that way. Where okay, what makes the world feel whole? What are the groups that would make it feel whole and believable? And then, how does the player interact with them? You know what we're doing with the the pirates, the Crimson Fleet, as well. They're not just this foe. Let the player join them. What does that mean? The cool thing about Crimson Fleet, you know, what if you're a good person and you want to be a good player and you don't want to play as a bad guy, you can side with the pirates or you can report back your superiors and be like basically space cop type of thing. So it lets you be a good person and still play with the bad guys. I think that's really cool too. It seems like no matter what story we write, the one the players tell themselves is the one that they think about and love the most and the companions. Hello, Captain. How may I be of assistance? So something we really, you know, leaned into on this game, how those other characters felt about you. That's probably my favorite part. Like when you're exploring and then your companion makes some comment off the cuff about something that you're checking out or something that just happened. It just feels so perfect for immersion. It's so believable. You think it's, it's a real person. So, you know, we knew we wanted to do some kind of persuasion mini game thing. Yeah, we sat down and it was funny. We didn't start with, let's do an evolution of, let's look back at the, the old Oblivion system, but there are a couple of uh, beats there. You have to think about what's my risk here, right? Which one do I want to choose? We didn't want it to be a system where there was definitely the right thing to say. It feels like you're having a conversation where you're actually trying to persuade somebody of something. Um, so it's actually, I think it's, as far as new systems in dialogue, I think it's, it's definitely one of the most successful ones that we've had. Yeah. I think when we knew we were making a game about space, you ask yourself certain questions, and that question is, what is out there? And so, as a game, we have romance, adventure, mystery, but I think with Starfield, there's this other layer of, you know, the cosmos and the universe and what is out there. At the end of it, we want the players to have told their own journey, but then look back at it and we're asking the big questions. Why are we all here? Where is it leading? And what's next for humanity? I always say that music is the fourth dimension. It is the emotional dimension. And so in order to create this, you have to ask these questions. Where are you going? You know, what's your motivation? What is your story? What is really pushing us? This is what really drove me more than anything else. These huge questions, they're as big as space. Everything I've worked on at this studio, the music started very early on, as early as the concept art for the game, from when I began here in 2005. At that time, Oblivion was already well, well underway, but as we went on to Fallout 3 after that, that was one of the first things I worked on music-wise was the main theme, and that's always been the case, where the main theme sets the tone for everything else we do in the game. And there's time throughout the entire project for that to evolve. 
That's true. And I remember like during the Fallout 4 uh, visit, which was actually in 2012, I was wandering um, through the corridors and I basically stumbled into um, the artist's room. And it was the first time I actually saw them do what they're doing. I was captivated. I was like, wow, I mean, this is really what it is all about. And I felt so inspired and motivated basically to go back and, you know, to do the same thing with the palette of music. The biggest challenge is actually creating the signature. I relax a lot once, once exactly. we feel good about the main theme because the rest is going to, it'll be work and iteration, but it's going to write itself. The way I looked at Starfield always is what I called the sanctified triplet, which is everything is streaming, right? Everything is changing and everything is returning back. Ta-da, ta-da, here is your development. And then ta-da, and, and back. So basically it presents itself, it develops, it goes back. The circular. is Exactly, some sort of like a circular um, journey. You go out, you adventure, discover, return. Yes, there's always the strive to go back home. And that's, I mean, I guess that's what feels so complete for us, right? We want to complete the mission. We want to complete our journey. We will find something, we will discover something, we'll take it with us, and we will go back home with it. When we built the traditional orchestral uh, sound palette. We actually really divided the orchestral group. For example, took the woodwinds, okay? And we created like a whole woodwind layer that almost represents particle in space because they don't play melodies at all. They play sort of like a high frequency sequence, you know, like together. So they almost don't sound like woodwind. They sound something between organic to synthetic, then the strings, they will play these long chords or long melodies and long crescendos and diminuendos. And these kind of things along the line with the fast moving woodwinds will create a nice blanket around these waves, okay? And then comes the brass. And the brass, especially the French horns, uh, playing sort of like the beacon you know, the call of the brass. Those instrument groups as well, a lot of times when you are looking at that whole main theme, I'm kind of salivating thinking about what can I do with that on the sound design side, you know, not just to weave the main theme in to different key points in the game, leveling up, discovering new places. Could we use that as straight up sound design to take those woodwind tremolos and just let's slow them way down, let's reverse them. I'll take any of that music and turn it into ambience somewhere. The music is like the companion. It's the companion to the player in the single player game. We don't have control over how the, how the player chooses to experience the game. Our sense of scale had to be totally readjusted in making a game on a planetary surface as we've always done before. And now where you have these very vast distances against this black starry background, it is a blank canvas in a massive playground and all the pieces are there for you to write your own story. Whether you jump right in and you wish to follow the main quest, the main story, and go to the obvious, one point leads to another, leads to another. The music has a funny way of playing the right chord change at the right time and a lot of that just happens at random. You look over the valley at just the right moment and that just happens to be when this one chord change happens and there are times like that that feel scripted and they're not. And I like that each player has that experience for themselves personally. I believe that the game is a whole experience and music is part of the whole experience. I believe that the best music in a game is a music that you don't hear, music that you feel. This is something that is bigger than us. I mean, so many people worked on this game um, and so my wish is that specifically the music will be present in a way that is going to magnify 
the entire experience. What you're looking at here is the pleasure city of Neon. The Xenofresh Corporation built a giant fishing platform on a rather nondescript aquatic world. They wanted to catch fish until they discovered a fish with psychotropic properties. They could make way more money selling a drug than they could fish. That drug is Aurora and is legal only on Neon. People come from all over to experience it and everything else Neon has to offer. Hi, I'm Emil Pagliarulu, Design Director of Bethesda Game Studios. What you're looking at here is the spaceport of the city of New Atlantis, the capital city of the United Colonies, or UC, the most powerful established military and political faction in the game. The city is a true melting pot, and its residents come from every race, creed, and ethnicity. In a lot of ways, New Atlantis is a true reflection of the future of our world. Behold Aquila City, the capital of the Free Star Collective, a loose confederation of three distinct star systems. The city itself is home to a variety of people, but they all have one thing in common. They believe in the sanctity of personal freedom and individuality. Aquila City is walled for a reason, and stepping outside those walls means facing the deadly Ashta, alien predators that are crossed between a wolf and a velociraptor. Hi, I'm Emil Pagliarulo, Design Director of Bethesda Game Studios. We're very excited to offer you this exclusive look at Starfield in the exciting universe we've created, which is an area of our solar system we call the Settled Systems. Our game is set in the year 2330, in a relatively small pocket of the Milky Way, in an area that extends outward from our solar system for approximately 50 light years. Around 20 years before the start of the game, the two largest factions in the Settled Systems, the United Colonies and Free Star Collective, engaged in the Bloody Colony War. Today, the major factions enjoy an uneasy peace, but the Settled Systems is still pretty dangerous. There are plenty of human threats out there, like ecliptic mercenaries, pirates of the Crimson Fleet, violent spacers, or even the fanatical religious zealots of House Varun. The organization known as Constellation is committed to uncovering the mysteries of the galaxy. And as one of its newest members, you'll explore the deepest reaches of the settled systems, and you'll find yourself at home in the Starfield. The opening vistas of space promise high cost as well as high reward. We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained. The exploration of space is one of the great adventures of all time. And we mean to be a part of it. We mean to lead it. Hi, I'm Istvan Paley, lead artist on Starfield at Bethesda Game Studios. We are excited to introduce you to one of our favorite companions in the game. Hello. Constellation's very own expeditionary robot, Vasco. As an early model built by Lunar Robotics, Vasco was refurbished to meet the requirements of Constellation's mission. He's a utilitarian, heavy industrial machine well suited to the rigors of space travel. Vasco's design is based on a standard Type A bipedal chassis capable of traversing rough terrain with all of the survival gear and payload capacity needed for extended overland journeys. Vasco does have defensive capabilities, should the need arise, but his primary role is peaceful. He wears the white and red livery of Constellation, though many years in the field have worn the paint and dented a few panels. How can I be of assistance? But he's still the reliable companion that an intrepid explorer like yourself can depend on. I'm Jess Finster, Community Director, and I'm here visiting Bethesda Game Studios where the team is hard at work on Starfield. I just want to say how grateful we all are for all of the feedback, support, and questions that you've been sharing with us on Reddit, Discord, Twitter. So we wanted to take a moment to answer some of those questions in our new series. So let's get started.
first thing that we want to know is what inspired Starfield? Oh, you know, so many things. Um, I think the main ones that, you know, I'm going to go back like in time here. Um, Sundog is a big one. Amazing game, kind of like the science fiction game when Ultimas were out. It also had this parcelless interface, kind of one of the first games where you're moving objects around and putting them together. But great game where you had your own ship and you could explore around uh, that I loved. Another one, this is a kind of pen and paper uh, role-playing game at the time where, you know, D&D was getting popular, is this game Traveler. Traveler was a little more hard science fiction. The other thing there is one of the first games I programmed on the Apple II at the time. I really wanted to make a Traveler game. It was also my first time realizing that computers had memory that you could run out of. <laughs> I can already see the comments, people saying, you've been running computers out of memory for 40 years now, but that's an easy comment, everybody. Great. You can do better. Um, but, but those are the big ones, hearkening back to those, to those old role-playing games that we loved and, hey, can we pull off something like this with today's computers and consoles, and et cetera? You mentioned a uh, hard space or hard sci-fi, and I know that that's one of the things that's been hotly debated in the community. Is Starfield considered a hard sci-fi? I never quite know, like, because that's always like, what do they think it is if you say yes or no? I think it is more hard to us, hard, hard science fiction, where you can draw that line from, okay, here's what, here's how man explored space, and you can like even look at our ships and say, all right, that has some, you know, visual identity back to that. But it's a trap question because it's a video game, right? Like a hard science fiction video game would be you die in space cold. And a good example, we were really into fuel and how the gravity drive works. And like, I'm reading papers on like quantum physics and, you know, bending space in front of you. You don't actually warp, you bend the space, you bring the space towards you. And so what we were playing that and it became like very punitive to the player. Your ship would run out of fuel and the game would just stop. You just want to get back to what you're doing. So we've recently changed it where the fuel in your ship and the grav drive limits how far you could go at once, but it doesn't run out of fuel. Maybe there'll be an update or a mod that allows that, but that's what we're doing now. Constellation members are excited about the character customization and the traits in the game. Can you talk more about what players will experience with the traits? I love our trait list, it's super fun. But each one obviously comes with some sort of negative as well. And we have a way in the game, kind of an activity or quest you can do to remove that trait, as opposed to, don't like my character, I want to start over. Each of them are something like that you can solve that removes the entire trait for the rest of your playthrough. The last question, we have speech checks and dialogue that reflect your character build. Do you want to expand upon that at all? Yeah, look, we've done a lot of different dialogue systems. And we've gone back to kind of a, I'll call it like a classic Bethesda style dialogue with you're looking at the character and how they emote. You have a series of choices there. The, the scope of the game, the amount of content we're making is a bit more than we've done before in terms of quests and things like that. But the depth in some of this stuff with the dialogue, we just passed 250,000 lines. And so that's a lot of dialogue, but we've gone through it and the impact is really there. And that includes my favorite speech persuasion system. You're not talking us out of this score. It feels like it's part of the dialogue, but you're spending points to persuade them. You're willing to give up the ship just like that? It feels natural, not like I've entered some other mode where we're not I'm not doing regular dialogue. It's just I'm in this mode of persuading you uh, to get what I want. Having a way with words might prove useful. That's it. That's all the questions that I had for today. Yeah, this has been great. You know, everybody out there, you know, keep it coming. We do really read it all. And also we look forward to showing you more of the game in the future as well. Today we're talking with Starfield's lead quest designer, Will Shen, on Quest. So let's get started. Hi, Will. Hi, Jess. Do you want to give a brief intro to yourself so they can get to know you a little bit better? Uh, sure. I'm, I'm Will Shen. I'm the lead quest designer on Starfield, and I am also responsible for the main quest. Well, we got some of the top questions from our community that they want to know about Starfield. First question. One of the best things about the previous games were random encounters that you have in the world. For Starfield, how has the random encounter system been improved or expanded upon, if at all? So very exciting this time around, we have entire planets that we have to populate. So we actually have new tech to take whole locations that we've built and put them on the planets. Now you could say maybe you're going to uh, an outpost and you actually discover there's a whole group of people there with a particular problem. 
Whereas, you know, before it might be just a person coming up to you along the road. Now it's an actual whole location that can be put there. And maybe they're, they have a problem like one of our member was kidnapped. They, they've been kidnapped by some pirates. And we think they're over there. We actually are replacing a whole other location with that person in it and enemies around it. So it's a dynamically placed settlement that is taking you to a dynamically placed dungeon as you're, as you're walking through the planet. So basically at any point in time on a planet, you can just experience a random encounter anywhere. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I think we're really only just scratching the surface of what that tech can do. We can see what looks like Earth's own solar system in the Starfield gameplay trailer. Will there be quests taking us back there and exploring how things have changed? Yeah, actually, very early on in the main quest, we take you to our solar system, which in our, our lore is called the Old Neighborhood. Nice. And you'll be uh, being sent there on a mission from Constellation to discover the mysteries of uh, the artifacts. And you'll get in contact with the uh, question of what happened to Earth, but also you'll go to Mars and there's actually a settlement, one of, one of the early settlements that humanity uh, created after they left Earth. Uh, it's called uh, Sidonia, and that's a whole city with its own problems and people to meet. How will faction quest lines work compared to other BGS games? Can we join multiple factions and complete all of them like in Skyrim, or does joining one lock you out of certain others like in Fallout 4? Yeah, so one of the early things we decided on was making sure that the main quest actually kind of gives you a little bit of a tour of the settled systems and all of the major players there so that we can give you a, a taste of what they're going to be up to. We're peacekeepers. We protect the people of the Free Star Collective. We also discussed really early on, like, okay, do we do we make some of the factions be in conflict with each other? And we decided, you know, we really want to make sure that you can play through all the faction lines uh, independently of each other. And this time around, we were like, no, we really want the stories to be a little more personal, right? You're influencing the direction of where this faction is going to go. So say the politics of the Free Star Rangers, right? You know, what's more important? Is it justice or industry, right? Where are you going to try to nudge them in this direction or another? So you don't necessarily end up as the head of every single faction of the game. But, you know, obviously all the major characters in every faction quest line will be reflecting on your choices. But, you know, it, it can have far reaching consequences for what that faction is, what it cares about. What will the role of some of the companions be during quests? The companions along the uh, Constellation storyline, which is the main quest, they'll have a lot of opinions and uh, points of view about what the decisions you'll be making along the main storyline. We've also added in several times where you can ask them to speak for you. So cool. you might have a companion with you and, and they'll be challenged to someone will tell you you can't get through here. And you can actually you know, turn to your companion and say, hey, actually, could you handle this? And they'll actually speak on your behalf and there could be consequences, uh, good or bad, for what they happen to say. And, and all the usual things you would expect from followers, right? They'll follow you into danger. You can trade equipment with them. And, you know, they'll also be crewing your ship, which is new. So they'll be helping out on your ship as well. Will NPCs react in different ways depending on how the player completes the quest? Yeah, I mean, all the quest lines have major characters, right? That they'll reflect on the decisions you're making, you know, and they'll have opinions about whether they're good or bad, you know, and for a few of the storylines and including the main quest, who ends up with you at the end, right? You know, there are some, you'll be determining the fates sometimes whether someone lives or dies or whether someone's still in the, in the faction or decides to leave the faction. There's a lot of different things that'll happen. That's all the questions I have for today. Thank you so much, Will, for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much to Will for volunteering his time to answer our questions, and thank you for submitting your questions. If you want to be the first to know about videos like this one or other news about Starfield, we encourage you to sign up to join Constellation. You can also submit any Starfield questions you would like to know at the hashtag here. So until next time, thank you, and we'll see you soon.